You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Hey everybody, Brian McClanahan here. We're back with the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This covers the week of February 8th through February 12th, 2016. So we're excited to have, we had another great week, excited to be back here on the podcast. Uh, just one quick reminder, we've only got about two weeks to go before our February conference, 2016, in Charleston, South Carolina, February 26th and 27th. You can sign up at the website. We have a nice little uh, post for it there. Uh, we, we want to see you there, the PC attack on the south. Uh, it should be a great time. We've had uh, a lot of signups here in the last uh, few days, so we're looking forward to seeing you there and uh, talking about this uh, pressing issue for the South, and not just for the South, but for the future of Western civilization as well. So uh, come on out. Uh, we'd like to talk to you and um, and meet you if we haven't met you before. If we have met you before, come on out. We'd like to see you again. So uh, we, we, uh, we're we going to do more of these things, and we need your support. Uh, if you can't make it to the conference and you feel like uh, donating to the cause uh, to help us explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition, remember we are a nonprofit organization, so go on over to our website and uh, find the support button and and uh, give a tax-deductible donation uh, for as little as uh, a little over $4 a month. You can help support the Institute, become a member, and um, uh, can help us continue to do what we're doing here, the podcast, the website events, things of that nature. So uh, we'd love your support. We'd love to see you in Charleston. Uh, and so um, uh, please consider that. Now, on to the week in review. Um, next, The next couple of weeks, we're going to do a theme at the website. This week, uh, no theme. Uh, but uh, again, as I've said before, the theme is always the Southern tradition. Uh, we had uh, some interesting articles this week, some things that uh, uh, we don't often put up there in terms of some uh, some ideas, uh, particularly the Tuesday article, um, and um, we're into the sesquicentennial of Reconstruction. So on Monday, we ran an article about Reconstruction, but it's an interesting article about Reconstruction because it was a speech, essentially, uh, most of the article, by a representative from Indiana named Daniel Voorhees, and uh, this particular uh, piece was um, was submitted by Karen Stokes. She's written for us uh, quite a bit, and she likes to go out and find uh, primary documentation, and then uh, write a little blog about it. Uh, and so Reconstruction in South Carolina is a very interesting topic because the the position on it, or at least the interpretation of it, has changed over time. If you look at how Reconstruction in South Carolina was described uh, in the early 20th century, in the late 19th century, uh, even in the, in the um, historical accounts of it, uh, uh, people like William Dunning, and the Dunning School, and uh, how they presented Reconstruction. The Reconstruction governments were corrupt. They uh, overspent. Um, they were uh, not very good governments. Uh, and I think what's happened over time is that people were not very happy with the way that was portrayed, particularly because of the fact that there were uh, a large number of black representatives in the uh, Reconstruct state governments in the South. And so uh, people like Dunning and others uh, pointed this out, and uh, they they um, and Dunning, of course, is not from the South, but uh, that they pointed this out and they they talked about how race was a factor in that. So what happened is uh, there has been an attempt to correct the historical record, or at least reinterpret it, and show that maybe these governments weren't so bad after all, uh, and that all of this was clouded by race. Well, the interesting thing about this piece by Daniel Voorhees is um, he really doesn't even mention race. Um, he talks about how the, how the government is corrupt and uh, how it wasn't just the, the black legislators that was doing this. It was the white legisla legislators as well. And how the governor of South Carolina was a carpetbagger and from, from Ohio uh, and how they were ruining the state government. They were ruining the state of South Carolina. And so this particular speech is quite interesting because he, he gives you some, some firm examples of things that were going on in the state. Uh, and he talks about the debt of the state. For example, he says in 1865, when the war ended in South Carolina, the state owed $5 million in debt. In 1871, it was $29 million. And so he's making this speech in 1872 several years before Reconstruction is going to end in South Carolina. 
He also said that there's 10 million more that is also disputed. So a $34 million increase in the state debt since Reconstruction began in the state. Uh, and much of that has come because of the activities of the governor of South Carolina, a man named Scott, who was from Ohio. And he has a very, has a very uh, interesting quote where he says, Governor Scott is said to be inve- investing large sums at Napoleon, Ohio, where his home in reality is and where he expects to retire when fully gorged with plunder. He went to South Carolina for pillage and rapine and will soon return with his spoils. So this is the interpretation that many Northerners and Southerners, you know, here, here's Voorhees from Indiana. And Voorhees uh, was uh, one of these individuals who opposed the Republican Party and, and the Lincoln administration during the war. And then, of course, after the war, uh, there were several of these individuals uh, in the North. But uh, Voorhees is one of the more conspicuous. And so he points out uh, that these people are becoming felons. That's all they are. Uh, he asks, do you expect the people to obey the laws when, they are, when their officials do not? Do you expect them to love and reverence a government whose policy has made them bankrupt and miserable? Do you wonder what, that they have become restless, desperate, and disobedient? Well, it makes sense. Uh, and he says that this was done because of our policies in Reconstruction. So now, the, the, again, the interpretation of Reconstruction by people like Eric Foner, the communists, essentially, Eric Foner is an is a open communist, is that Reconstruction didn't go far enough that the real problem with Reconstruction is that the South was not punished enough. And that essentially is the position that the radical Republicans were taking, that the South needs to be punished, is to punish the South, to remake the South, uh, to exact revenge on the South. Uh, and the South was punished during Reconstruction, and it was punished through very bad government, uh, mostly because of carpetbag rule, what they would call carpetbag rule, or through what they called scalawag rule. Uh, so... Uh, it, it's interesting how interpretations have changed in the last, say, 50 or 60 years uh, because the, the effort was made to show, well, well, these governments weren't really so bad and maybe they didn't go far enough. Uh, if you were to look at interpretations of Reconstruction uh, right after the war and into the early 20th century, it was Reconstruction was awful. It went way too far. And um, there's a great collection of essays uh, and primary documents about Reconstruction by... Um, the Dunning School Historians, it's the uh, Documentary History of Reconstruction. You can get it online for free uh, by uh, uh, Fleming, is the, is the editor. Uh, and Fleming was one of the, uh, one of the Dunning acolytes uh, and one of the, one of the students of, of William Dunning. And he wrote uh, several histories of the South and, of course, of Reconstruction. And he collected all these primary source materials, and he gets into the issues of Reconstruction, what was going on and across the board, whether it was political, economic, social, all the things that were happening in Reconstruction. And so Reconstruction was often considered a sorry episode in American history, that is, until about the last 40 to 50 years, uh, when people have said, well, Reconstruction just wasn't really that bad, and it should have been, should have been harder on the South. Uh, that's the Foner School. And unfortunately, that's kind of the dominant uh, interpretation of Reconstruction today. You don't really read uh, Dunning or any of the other uh, Dunning School uh, uh, students. When I, was at, uh, when I was in graduate school, though, it's uh, the, uh, one, of the, one of the seminars I took, one of the last seminars I took, uh, the historian who, who ran it was Mark Smith. Uh, Mark Smith is a, is a real professional. He's, he's interested in, in uh, getting to the bottom of the truth, uh, no matter if it's popular or not, fashionable or not. Um, and he, he mentioned something that was quite interesting about Reconstruction. One, one of the other students in the class was writing a, an essay on Reconstruction, and he pulled out uh, how interpretations of Reconstruction have, have lost complexity since the middle of the 20th century. And he was always interested in many of the older histories of the South because he said they offered complexity uh, that we don't even have in the modern interpretation. So he showed this little chart and how Reconstruction has narrowed out, and it's, it's basically there's no complexity at all. At all. It's, very, it's a very vanilla interpretation. Everyone follows the same line. They don't ever buck the trend. And he points out that Dunning was actually much more complex in his analysis of Reconstruction because he gets into things the others ignore. Uh, and so uh, if you want to read a really good history of Reconstruction in the South, uh, read Dunning's uh, History of Reconstruction. Uh, it's, uh, it's available for free, William A. Dunning. And you can just do that search for that, Reconstruction, and his book will come up. 
I was in the uh, early American Nation series of histories, and a lot of those were very good as well. Um, so uh, Reconstruction, or, or opinion of Reconstruction interpretation, because of the historical profession, I think at large has changed. You're not seeing much about the sesquicentennial of Reconstruction, um, but we're going to have it for the next decade or so. And so uh, we're going to try to put more material out there about it uh, uh, for you to read on the website and uh, different interpretations of it, uh, because it is one of these uh, monumental events in American history. And, and in reality, we're still under, undergoing Reconstruction. Uh, it's, um, it's an event that really hasn't ended. Uh, and it began, or before 1866, actually began in 1862. And some historians will say, well, it ended in 1876. No, Reconstruction carried on through the New South and uh, the Gilded Age, uh, carried on through into the 20th century. This is something that the, uh, the fugitive agrarians were talking about when they wrote, I'll take my stand. They're looking at the South and saying, we're being reconstructed now. Uh, this, this is ongoing. Uh, and so the, the effort was to show how long that process was. Uh, and we're, we're, again, we're still undergoing it. Um, the South has been transformed economically, socially, uh, physically in the last 150 years. And perhaps it's still a process by which uh, the South is, is going through. Same thing with the North. I mean, Reconstruction didn't just affect the South. It, it transformed the North and the West as well. And I think that's something that's often missed in our discussion of Reconstruction in the modern historical profession. In fact, there was a, a very interesting book about the uh, American Indian tribes in Reconstruction in Oklahoma. And uh, the title escapes me, but uh, it was essentially discussing the tribes that had supported the Confederacy and how there was revenge exacted on those tribes in Oklahoma after the war because the Union thought these people are traitors and they need to be punished, just like Southerners would be punished, just like the other American Indian tribes would be punished during Reconstruction. The reservation system and the assimilation process that began because of that, uh, the Dawes Commission, all of that came out of Reconstruction. So when the South was uh, not necessarily the target of Reconstruction anymore after 1876, the American Indian tribes on the, on the frontier were the, were the targets of Reconstruction. So this is a, a major process that affected all elements of life in the United States, not just in the South, but also in the North and the West. So it's a, a, complex, uh, it's a complex event that really needs to be discussed in its entirety. Now, uh, the next piece it's kind of in line with, with Reconstruction. Um, it's written by uh, John Marcourt, and uh, the title is Elephants and Dixie. And he gets into the transformation of politics in the South and um, how things have changed over time. And he starts with a, tracing the rise of the Republican Party, and the, uh, and particularly in the South, and how the South today is strongly Republican and where that comes from. Of course, um, none of us, well, at least I don't, uh, many people I know, Clyde Wilson and others, have no love lost for the Republican Party. Uh, we're, we think the Republican Party is uh, one of the problems in the South because it's the same Republican Party that was around in 1861 uh, or when it was started in 1854 in the 1850s. Uh, it, it's, it's not really any different, and the Republican Party has never had the South uh, in its uh, and its interest, um, it, it's always been one that uh, is dominated by the North, or at least a Northern ideology. Um, so he gets into the, the fact that the South, of course, was very much interested in the old Jeffersonian idea of limited government, uh, the compact fact of the Constitution, and how that changed, at least in terms of party. Uh, how the South uh, was always voting in a solid block and how that solid block was always looking for the candidate that could best represent that original intent of the Constitution. And today, it seems that that's the Republican Party, but, but he has a warning. Uh, he says at the end of the piece, It must also, however, be borne in mind by everyone in America, be they Democrat, Republican, or Independent, that after the Roman Republic abdicated its power and became an empire, the seeds of Rome's decline and ultimate fall were sown. A similar fate could well befall the American Republic if it casts aside the basic Southern concepts of republicanism and sovereign rights, and if its citizens continue to surrender their constitutional liberties in return for the modern-day equivalent of Imperial Rome's largesse of bread and circuses, entitlements and subsidies. And so this is something that's been pointed out before uh, at the website and on this podcast. Uh, the South has continually voted against federal usurpations of power, particularly in the last, say, 30 years, 
as the and, and you look at even the New Deal era, it was the South that first stood up against the New Deal. Josiah Bailey in North Carolina, in North Carolina, with the Conservative Manifesto, it was the South that first started saying, "Wait a second here." Uh, while we may have supported the general idea of the New Deal at first, you've gone way too far. Uh, and it was the South that was always trying to block uh, unconstitutional legislation, even to this day. If you look at how the South votes and you pick uh, certain pieces of legislation, whether it's the Affordable Care Act, immigration, I mean, take your pick on some of the hot-button topics. The South generally is opposed to it, and the North is generally for it. And so this is why people have talked about, you know, what is the best interest of the South today? Is it an independent South? Uh, is it a South? We ha should we have regional t style of government when it comes to domestic issues? I mean, rethinking this American Union, and is it beneficial for the people of the South anymore? Uh, certainly it's, uh, it's beneficial for the people of the North. They get a lot of what they want. Uh, but is it beneficial for the people of the South? Of course, there's always the critique that, well, you know, the South is a net receiver of federal income. So we, we, we get more back in return than we pay out in taxes through social welfare legislation and other things. Uh, but the, the, the voting of the South continually goes against that. And so this is a very interesting, uh, interesting debate to have. Where should the South stand? Should we, should we support the Republican Party? Uh, should we re should we support a different party? Should there be a pro-Southern party? Uh, we've seen this. Uh, and I think this is in part why so many Southerners are supporting Trump uh, for president now, because he represents something different. He represents a, a, a trend to buck the establishment, and the South has always tried to buck the establishment. Uh, when the establishment is not for them, they vote against it. Uh, and so Trump represents this this resurgence of an anti-establishment ideology, and, I, and, and Trump has a lot of support in the South um, because of that. So, and, and so did other people like Pat Buchanan. You go back and, he, and uh, the article, um, John, uh, Jack actually talks about uh, you know, how Nixon tapped into that in 1972 as Southern strategy, and Reagan was able to capitalize on that. Uh, and so uh, w the idea that you know, when the flip happened, when the South started going for, uh, for Republicans, it was when Goldwater was running for president. And, of course, uh, in, in 1968, uh, and, and in the early 70s, you had a strong support for people like George Wallace, who, again, were tapping into this South as different from the rest of the United States. It always has been. It's always been the conservative hedge against all the innovations of the North. And uh, John C. Calhoun called it the flywheel, right? If the, if, the, if the South falls apart, the rest of the Union falls apart, uh, particularly anyone who is interested in a conservative United States. They need the South. Uh, and this is why you have, uh, you know, other people in the North saying, well, we're better off without them. Uh, and so the response to that is, well, we tried that once, right? You didn't let us go. And I think that there's a, a definite um, uh, effort by some of the North to keep the South in because that gives them a, a boogeyman, a, a, an evil other to talk about. And so as long as you have that, you can, uh, you can have an enemy, so to speak. Uh, the, the other side needs an enemy, and the South serves that purpose. So uh, where, where the Republicans come from, it's a nice little piece talking about the, tracing the origins of the Republican stronghold of the South, um, how you know, maybe that's not uh, always uh, the best thing, and, and maybe um, the, South, uh, <laughs> the South could be well, uh, well uh, understand that uh, we need to resist these unconstitutional usurpations of power and look for, at times, something else if the Republican Party is not in our best interest. Okay, uh, Wednesday, another uh, installment in the sayings by our four Southerners from Clyde Wilson, Part 25. Uh, and again, several great uh, quotes. Uh, he begins with an Eric Vogelin quote, the death of the spirit is the price of progress. And he puts um, several quotes in here, some of them from, um, from uh, people who are uh, now writing today. Uh, but... Um, one that I thought was really interesting was a, was a piece from a Tombstone, Arizona newspaper from 1881. Here's the quote. The people who are anxious to assert their constitutional right to bear arms ought to do it openly. The revolutionary fathers who put this into the Bill of Rights did not go around with little pistols concealed in their hip pockets. They carried their muskets or rifles over their shoulders like men. Uh, so here we are in an era where we're talking about um, uh, gun rights again. It seems like it comes up every so often. Every year or so, we get we get talking about gun rights. 
And uh, here we are in Tombstone, Arizona in 1881. They're talking about gun rights. And, of course, the idea in Tombstone was to, um, was to make it illegal to carry firearms. He also has a quote from Jefferson Davis, Of what value are paper constitutions and oaths binding officers to their preservation? If there is not intelligence enough in the people to discern the violations and virtue enough to resist the violators. Uh, and so a constitution is, is worthless unless people are willing to stand up and say, you have violated it and you need to be held accountable for that. That's all Davis is saying here. So this is a, uh, an interesting uh, a series of, of quotes. He actually ends with a quote by Vladimir Putin who says, To forgive the terrorists is up to God, but to send them to him is up to me. And uh, he used to always close with a, uh, a, a, a saying by O. Henry, if only Longstreet had. But now he's, he's uh, finished up these, uh, these uh, series of um, quotations with a quote from Dr. Robert Peters of Louisiana. And this is it. Uh, the South is a garden. It has been worn out by the war, reconstruction, the period of desolation, the depression, and the worst ravages of all modernity. Yet a worn out garden, its contours perceived by keen eyes, the fruitfulness of its past stored in memory, can be over time a time which will last no longer than those of us who initially set our minds to the task restored to once again produce, for the time appointed unto it, the fruits which nurture the human spirit and which foreshadow the garden of which there will be no end. Uh, so a, a wonderful quote about the South. It needs to be nurtured and watered and treated with love. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, whether that will bear fruit or not, it's unknown, but it needs to at least have an effort put forward to it. Now, the, the Thursday piece uh, is, um, was written by George Petrie. Now, again, this comes from a chapter in the South and the Building of the Nation series, and George Petrie was one of the more important individuals in the history of Auburn University. And the really cool thing about this particular series of books, there's, it's a multi-volume series, and you look at the authors in the series, and these authors are all Southerners. And it makes you jealous for a time when Southern historians were real Southerners. Nowadays, it's almost all carpetbaggers that take up in, uh, positions in Southern institutions. They come to the South, and, it's, and they believe that it's up to them to tell Southerners what their history is. There used to be a time when Southerners wrote their own history. And this South and the Building of the Nation series is that. In the early 20th century, you had several leading Southern scholars from all over the South, uh, from, all, from many different universities, write chapters in this series of books. And it's a marvelous series. Uh, you, they go through the history of the states. They go through the political history of the South. And actually, that's where this is from. They go through the social history of the South, the economic history of the South, the, the uh, artistic history of the South. They do a, a series on uh, 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 a, a volume on biography in the South. And they tell you at the, at the front of the book, in the introduction, this, as this series on biographies is done because we think Southern biography has been distorted by Northerners. And so the, the effort was made by Southerners themselves to tell their own history. And George Petrie, he's revered at Auburn University. Uh, he is, he is a, a very interesting individual. This is a guy that um, was the founder of the history department in the graduate school at, at Auburn University. He was also the founder of the school's athletic program. In fact, he coached the first football team in 1892. He wrote the Auburn Creed. A very important individual in the history of Auburn University uh, he was a proud son of a Confederate veteran. Uh, he was the first Alabamian to receive a Ph.D., which he did uh, so at Johns Hopkins University. And so this particular article is on the history of secession. And he begins with a really great, great statement. He says, The political theory on which the southern states in 1860 and 1861 based their right to withdraw from the Union was not the sudden creation of any one man or any one group of men. Like other ideas that have played a prominent part in history, it was a gradual evolution from earlier and less elaborate conceptions. And he says its history goes back to the colonial days. Well, that's exactly right. So he talks about how uh, secession was not born in 1860. And how the, the seeds of secession can actually be traced back to the American War for Independence. And how those men who were fighting for independence, were interested in secession. I mean, that's essentially what it was. 
And he goes to talk about the Articles of Confederation and how when that document was uh, essentially ratified by the states, unanimously by the states eventually, how there was, def- there was talk at all times about secession. Uh, so it was openly discussed in the early days of the Federal Republic. And this is one of the reasons why we had a Philadelphia, the call for the Philadelphia Convention to try to strengthen the national government. But even then, there, were talk, there was talk about secession. Uh, and he mentions that Northerners in New England, Federalists in New England, were the ones who spoke about secession first. In fact, he gives a quote by Governor Wolcott. Wolcott was uh, a proponent of the Constitution of Connecticut, and he says, quote, I sincerely declare that I wish the northern states would separate from the southern the moment that event shall take place. And he's talking about um, the idea that Jay's treaty would not be confirmed. So here we have a treaty that the north wants, the south doesn't. And so the north is actually talking about secession in 1796. This is, uh, this is something that people don't often read much about or know much about. And then he gets into the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions uh, and how Federalists in the, in the Jefferson administration and then the Madison administration were pushing for secession at the Hartford Convention uh, and how that was uh, openly discussed. And so you, here you have the North again. He misses some other parts of secession. He misses the, uh, the fact that in 1794, uh, Rufus King and Oliver Ellsworth uh, pulled John Taylor of Carolina's side and said, look, we want to secede from the Union. Uh, so 1794, there was talk about it. He, he misses, uh, he doesn't really talk about the uh, idea of secession in 1800 when uh, there were several Federalists who wanted to secede if Jefferson was going to be elected president or 1803 after the Louisiana Purchase. So again, it's, it's constant. The North was constantly pushing for secession. So this wasn't something in 1860 and 61 that just happened overnight. Uh, he talks about nullification in South Carolina, and how there were people at that point who were interested in, in secession, but also how this the Constitution really is a compact fact, and how uh, people understood the states to be sovereign. Um, he 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 quotes Saint George Tucker, uh, who wrote his commentaries on Blackstone and how that people considered the states to be sovereign, and that could they could do uh, whatever sovereign states may have right to, which is what Jefferson said in the Declaration of Independence. Just the Constitution didn't destroy their sovereignty. And how it's uh, essentially the only reason secession happened is he, because he says, quote, the determination of the national government to use force against the seceding states gave rise to the last phase of the doctrine of secession. The doctrine that a state had the right to secede implied, of course, that no one had a legal right to use force to prevent it. Others, he says, like Lincoln, held strongly to the national view of our government and believed in a right and a duty to put down what they considered rebellion. Under these circumstances, war was inevitable. So war, he basically is implying here, war didn't have to happen. Only when you had one side of the government saying that it's a national government, that it's the right of the national government to put down insurrection. Uh, and that's the only reason we had war in 1861, because the Lincoln administration would not allow the states to secede and determ- have self-determination, determine their own course. But Lincoln himself had said, and he doesn't bring this up, but Lincoln himself had said in the 1840s, that essentially states had a right to secede. Everyone thought that. That's the really interesting thing about the war. Everyone, North and South, thought for the first 80 years of the government that the states had a right to secede from the Union. Even Virginia had a resumption clause in its ratification of the Constitution. So did New York. That if this thing fell apart, or if the government started abusing its power, these states could secede from the Union. Everyone thought that. They understood it to be a compact between states. They understood that the states ratified the Constitution, so therefore the states could uh, could secede from the Constitution. They acceded to it, so they could secede from it. North and South. Uh, and again, the earliest efforts at secession were in the North. You had abolitionists talking openly about secession. Uh, Garrison, uh, in 1848 talked openly about secession. William Lloyd Garrison, uh, Lysander Spooner talked about secession, that abolitionists should look more to secede themselves than uh, to force the South out. This is why Spooner, again, wasn't even interested in coercion. He said, look, we've gotten what we wanted. The South is out of the Union. Let's, let's just get along with our, let's just go on with our government. We've got a government. We don't need the South in it. This is what we wanted the whole time. 
So this idea of secession, which has now been buried and is considered treason and all the other things that are thrown around, if you look at it from a historical perspective in the long view, then every member of the founding generation was a traitor. And every man who talked about secession, north and south, again, the north first, well, why don't we call them out as being traitors? Because people don't know this history. And if they knew this history, uh, I think the perspective on what the South did and the perspective on Southern history would change dramatically. When I teach this issue uh, every semester, um, I often find that people are shocked to hear that the North won a secession first. And it was the North that was actively pushing for it. Just a few years after the Constitution was ratified, and also, you bring up the fact that North Carolina and Rhode Island did not ratify the Constitution. They were essentially independent republics, uh, Rhode Island longer than North Carolina. And that shows conclusively that the Constitution was a compact between states. But this is not something you're going to hear in mainstream history. It's not something you're going to hear from quote-unquote constitutionalists. The problem with constitutionalists today is that many of them are textualists, and a textual interpretation can lead to a loose interpretation of the Constitution because you can read in to the text. Uh, and you see this with um, the federal judiciary and how they interpret the Constitution. An originalist position does not just read the text of the Constitution. They look for original meaning and how the founding generation sold the Constitution to the states when it was up for ratification in 1787 and 1788. Madison himself said that the, the ratification debates or where you get the true meaning of the document. But we don't often hear that. I mean, originalism has been buried. Uh, but I think it's coming back. Uh, and as I've been uh, doing the promotion for my, for my new book, Nine Presidents Who Screwed Up America and Four Who Tried to Save Her, what I find is that people are uh, interested in this originalist interpretation. And if you use that to attack uh, executive usurpations of power or legislative usurpations of power or judicial usurpations of power, usurpations of power by the general government. If you use that original constitution, that original idea, you find that people are much more receptive to it. Because people want on the right, they want to be constitutionalists. They want to say, well, we've got a constitution, let's follow it. But you have to explain to them what constitution we're following. It's not just the text. And you have to be consistent in that application. And so as you look at history, history of the United States, the first 80 years of history of the United States, you find over and over again that secession was openly discussed, north and south, more north than south originally, uh, and that it only changed uh, you know, here in the, in the middle of the 19th century how northerners were so much against it. I think in some ways this is why the south was, was shocked when the north insisted on coercion because they had for so long advocated secession before that. So um, this is a great article by George Petrie. George Petrie is an interesting guy. Actually, uh, we included a link uh, to a, a talk about George Petrie at Auburn University. Uh, one of the, uh, 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 a man had written a book on George Petrie, and so he gave a little presentation on George Petrie at Auburn. And it's a nice little, nice little presentation, about an hour long. So uh, you can go out there and watch that. Now, the last uh, piece for the week was on James I. Riedel, by Dave Benner. Uh, we've had a piece on Irie Dell before, but it's always good to remind people who Irie Dell really was. Uh, Irie Dell uh, was an ardent proponent of the Constitution from North Carolina, and um, he was a great patriot, uh, was interested in independence, uh, and when the, when the United States gained its independence and you started looking at a new central government, which Irie Dell was in support of. He and uh, William Richardson Davey were two very ardent proponents of the Constitution in North Carolina. When you look at how they sold the Constitution to the states, or at least to North Carolina itself, you find that uh, they give a very interesting defense of the Constitution. It's a, f it's a defense of federalism. Look, the Constitution is not going to destroy the states. All we've simply done is given the general government some more power that they didn't have, but the federal nature of the Union stays intact. And that's how the Constitution was sold north and south to wavering delegates. We haven't created a national government. We've created a federal government, a federal republic. And what does a federal republic mean? It's a, it's a republic of independent states joined together for 
delegated purposes, and that's commerce and defense, and that's it. And he made several very interesting statements about that. For example, uh, uh, Mr. Benner brings up the fact that Ivory Dell said, quote, when Congress passes a law consistent with the Constitution, it is to be binding on the people. If Congress, under pretense of executing one power, should, in fact, usurp another, they will violate the Constitution. And that should be resisted, his point was. And uh, this quote is taken from a very good book on this. It's, uh, it's uh, The Founding Father's Guide to the Constitution, written by yours truly. So uh, that was the point of my book on that, to bring out this original interpretation of the Constitution. And so the, the Constitution was sold in Georgia on a very, what we would call, states' rights position. The states hold all the cards. And the federal government cannot go beyond those powers. So I think that's, again, that's something we need to point out with the Constitution. When the Constitution was sold, this is that originalist interpretation, when the Constitution was sold to the states, the states held all the cards. Uh, the, the Senate was the state block on the entire system. If, they re if the states refused to send senators, the entire system would fall apart. This was mentioned several times, also in North Carolina. And so I. Riedel actually goes to the Supreme Court. He's appointed the Supreme Court. He was one of the original six justices of the Supreme Court, George Washington nominated. And he was on the bench in the very famous case of Chisholm v. Georgia. And the case of Chisholm v. Georgia led to the 11th Amendment because uh, the state of Georgia was being sued and Georgia refused to consent to the suit. But the Supreme Court uh, ruled against Georgia anyways. And so uh, you get the 11th Amendment, which says a state cannot be sued without its consent. This is state sovereign immunity. And Irie Dell was the lone dissenter in the case of Chisholm v. Georgia, and he said, quote, I believe there is no doubt that neither in a state now in question nor in any other in the Union, any particular legislative mode authorizing a compulsory suit for the recovery of money against the state was in being either when the Constitution was adopted or at the time the Judicial Act was passed. So he's saying... The states cannot be sued. No one ever contemplated this in Philadelphia. No one contemplated this when the state when the Constitution was being ratified. No one contemplated it when the Judiciary Act of 1789 was passed. And so now a state cannot be sued without its consent. Now, the interesting thing about that is that the Supreme Court has tried over the years to narrow that decision, narrow that interpretation on the 11th Amendment to where it really doesn't apply very often. But in theory, a state can say, you can bring a suit against me, but I'm, I'm not going to be part of this. I refuse to be sued. And therefore, the case stops there. The 11th Amendment is a very powerful amendment. The states just don't use it. But the state can refuse to be sued. And I think that the people of the states, particularly in our state legal system, need to understand that they can just refuse. The states have a lot of power still. It's just they don't use it. And I think that's one of the great takeaways we need to get all the time. The states, and I, and I think I, I'm encouraged by what's happened in the last 20 years. You have a lot of people who are starting to say enough at the state level. And you're seeing it across the United States, whether it's north, south, on a variety of issues. People in the states are saying, you know what? The government has exceeded its power, and we're going to try to stop it at the state level. We can't rely on the bums in Washington, D.C. to do it anymore because we elect them, and they don't do anything. Uh, and so when I'm asked typically, you know, who's going to save America? Well, the states are going to save America. That's the only people who can really do it. I mean, we can, we can vote for, you know, Trump or Cruz or ever, take your pick. I mean, we want to take, pick one of these Republican candidates. Uh, they're not going to be able to do it by themselves. Uh, the states have to do it, and it's up to the people of the states to do it. So voting better people in is not necessarily the answer. It's, it's not, the, it's not the, uh, the magic potion to save the federal republic. It has to come from the people of the states. And the people of the states have to say enough. And many people in the states are starting to do this. And I think that pushback is actually having some much-needed effect on the federal government. Not always. It doesn't always go the right way. But I think states are starting to realize they can do more and they should do more to try to rein in that federal government. And that is part of the Southern tradition that we want to preserve because the South held on to that position longer than the North. The North, of course, was fully, fully behind this as well. We've seen it when we talked about secession or resistance to central authority. Uh, the North was 
much was very much on board with this idea throughout much of early, the early history of the United States. But it dropped that idea, and the South held on to it longer. So it has become part of the Southern tradition, and even when you look at how Republicans have, uh, 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 Southerners have voted Republican, that's essentially what they're hanging on to, that principle, which, of course, goes back to Southern culture, Cavalier, Celtic culture, resistance to central authority. So that's one of the things we can take away from the Southern tradition. Take your pick of the issue. The state should have more power, and this, if the people of uh, you know, Vermont want to have their socialist republic, uh, they can have Bernie Sanders as president, they can have it. It just won't affect the South. And if the people of the South want to have something else, they should have that too. People of California want to have something else, they can have that. That is very much part of the Southern tradition. That's something we should always be talking about and promoting, because that is something that is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. So keep that in mind when you're talking about the South and uh, what's good about the South. And people say, well, the South is you know bad, this, this, and this. You have to be able to defend the South and defend the Southern tradition, and you have to play on our field, not on theirs. And that's one way you can do it, is by bringing this particular issue up. Until next time, good day. Mm-hmm.